Hey guys, welcome back to chapter 13. And by back, I mean welcome back to class because we are just starting chapter 13. Uh, first lecture, and I think we're, you're going to really enjoy this chapter. It's, it's pretty fascinating. We are going to be digging into the concept of biodiversity and why we are trying to conserve biodiversity on the planet. So to take a peek about the different objectives we're going to be learning today, we're just going to focus on the first one in this lecture and really understanding what genetic diversity is um, and verse versus just genetic versus species diversity on the earth, and uh, a little bit how basically our ecosystems functioning are changing. Why are they changing over time? So dig into some idea next time. So key idea number one, what in the world are we talking about with genetic diversity? Well, let's define a couple things first. Um, first of all, this idea of extinction. So if something is extinct, there are no longer in individuals of that species on the earth. And we've heard of endangered species or threatened species before. So extinction means we're losing the species forever, as in they'll, they'll, they will never come back. And right now we're kind of in an extinction problem. And more so than we have been in the past. So right now we're currently losing approximately 50,000 species of life per year. So 0.5% of all species now alive go extinct every year. That's a big issue. Um, we don't want that. We want a diverse ecosystem for a variety of reasons. So environmental scientists are trying to figure out why this is happening and try to, trying to mitigate this type of biodiversity loss. So when we think about diversity, we're thinking about the genetics. So as in, even within our own species, let's think about maybe bears or something or, or a fish. Within that that set of species, we want to conserve genetic diversity because if there's only a small pool of genetic um, species, they have to breed with each other and then inbreeding can occur. So inbreeding is not a healthy thing for any species. So inbreeding is basically when you have a similar genetic basis, so we call them genotypes. If you breed, like if they're relatives to each other, for example, this is what we call inbreeding. So you and your relatives have very similar genetic genotypes. And if you would breed with a relative, uh, you would have a higher probability of passing on two sets of bad traits to your, to your children. You don't want that because then they are going to pass those on, etc. And you start amplifying this, these bad genetic traits. So call this the population with low genetic diversity uh, usually suffers something called inbreeding depression where inbreeding itself causes the species to not likely to survive. They get bad genetic traits that cause them to die sooner. So you have this depression of the species population just through inbreeding. So to avoid inbreeding, you want to keep the biodiversity high. You want a lot of different species with different genotypes. So let's talk about this a little bit more. I added a few more points here. So inbred individuals are more likely to express harmful genetic mutations or genetic traits. So again, if both parents have some really harmful genetic trait, well, their offspring is going to receive two copies of that trait. So those individuals are going to be less likely to survive because now they have two of those copies of that trait in their genetic pool. So you want parents that have diverse genetic backgrounds mating with each other, ideally to keep the gene pool um, more diverse. So high genetic diversity ensures that a wider range are present, and that that will reduce the probability that that offspring will receive two harmful mutations from parents. If they receive one, it might not be um, that that bad. Maybe that the harmful mutation actually is is not even going to um, be a problem. So inbreeding depression is a big issue once you start chopping down the amount of species in the environment. And we've seen some specific cases of that over the years. This is one case the book brings up. So there's a species of of panther, the Florida panther, and that kind of cougar type variety. And due to declining in declines in population, these are both natural and anthropogenic human caused. So for example, there's natural predators like alligators for these type of panthers, but also losing their um, losing their environment through the spread of humans in their area. Their population starts to decline. And then what happens is inbreeding occurs. So they had this inbreeding depression effect where they were passing along things like heart defects and um, abnormal sperm morphologies 
things that decrease the chance of survival for their offspring. So you have this you have this depression of their populations. So what they tried to do in, to increase the diversity of their genotypes, what they did was introduced um, some Texas population of panthers. So you would add in another population, another species to help breed and increase the biodiversity. And they've seen a, a bounce back of population of the Florida panther because of this. So that was a, a good success. So this was really just the talk of genetic diversity in general, and also not the human, not, not human, sorry, animal species in the world. But the other side of this is also crops and livestock, so not wild animals. First of all, crops and the livestock that we actually grow. Trying to keep these genetically diverse is also very important. And it's something that a lot of scientists spend a lot of time thinking about. And one of the first things you see in this book is showing you this global seed bank. There's a lot of these around the world. This is an international one where people can come and store seed varieties. And this is built into a mountain to protect it from natural disasters, for example, like a nuclear warhead or something, hopefully, but or just global warming in general. They're kept at a really constant temperature. So there's, there's thousands and thousands of seed varieties stored in here to make sure that we don't lose those seeds, that we can introduce them back into the world if we need to. So crop diversity in general, we used to be a lot more diverse in our crops. You would think about all the farmers spread across the country where they all had their local kind of naturally existing ecosystems. And back then we had a lot more specific and unique ecosystems. So specific crops would grow at different specific temperatures and soil compositions, so you'd have all these diverse types of crops. So we used to have thousands and thousands of these varieties. For example, apples, just a century ago, we used to have around 8,000 varieties of apples versus we kind of are used to seeing about 100, which might seem a lot, but in the world of genetic diversity, that's really small. And then you go to the grocery store and what do you see? You can't even buy 100 varieties of these. You can buy maybe 10 varieties at the grocery store, so we went to 8,000 to 100 of just looking at apples. That's just one, uh, one example. So practically, what's the problem here? Well, the book goes into this example. In the 1970s, there was this fungus that came and killed half the crops of the U.S. of corn. So this corn was selected over the years. That's the problem here. We, we started noticing which varieties produced a lot, high productivity. So we didn't pick for flavor or color or or um, resilience to fungus, for example, we picked for a high productivity. And these high productivity growing corns were not able to combat against this fungus. The only reason we survived this mess is we found another variety of corn that was able to uh, be resistant to this fungus. And we genetically modified the high productivity one to include a gene that was uh, uh, resistant. So it was a high yielding variety and also became resistant. If we didn't have that variety, if that other one had died out and got lost, what would we have done? So that's the point. We want to keep as many diverse, genetically diverse batch of seeds and crops available so that we can combat against these types of issues. Also, it's just wonderful in the world of culinary cuisine to have more than just the high producing varieties. So uh, this is another picture of that seed vault in Norway, by the way. I, I found this. There's a lot of these photos. In there. It's pretty striking. First of all, they, they took some time in architecture to build a really beautiful, interesting entrance. This kind of, a, I don't know exactly what is up here, this kind of glass kind of art piece almost. And this goes directly into the side of this hill, this mountain. So the seed vault's way down here. This is just a really cool looking entrance. So that's that seed vault in Norway. So yeah, we want to, first of all, you don't want inbreeding to occur. You have that inbreeding depression effect. Then for crops and livestock, we want to have healthy variety in the crops and livestock we have. If you think about livestock, actually I'll go to livestock in a second. I want to talk about crop diversity. In the world of cuisine, for example, I watch a lot of Netflix cooking shows and this, this Carolina gold rice pops up a lot in some of these, these shows. And this is a very renowned and delicious, apparently, rice variety that was almost lost. It was, it's, there's a lot of history in this article about it. It says... Um, there's kind of myths of trying to figure out where it came from. So some people think that it was brought from Madagascar in the 1690s. 
that slaves smuggled the grain to Carolina, that who knows what. But this, this, this rice variety was renowned in the South. And, but however, as you start selecting for specific types of high-yielding rice, these other ones kind of get lost. But this is a really popular rice now in Southern cuisine and cuisine all over the country. And myself, I would like to order some of this sometime. It's supposed to be just insanely delicious and flavorful. And it's just, you know, it's, it's similar to just normal white rice, but it's a specific variety. And we would lose these things unless people went out of their way to save the seeds and cultivate and get these back on the market. So culinary world, biodiversity of crops. So that's just one, some other thing I would like to mention. Now, livestock, why do we care about diverse livestock? Well, same kind of reason for the, um, the, the wild animals. If we only select for high, you know, fat or delicious meat or something that we deem ultimately is what we want, We'll lose all the other varieties of these livestock, and these lives we want to we want a diverse variety because one livestock might be subjected to a disease, or we we want to have the ability to raise livestock that can combat against all different types of effects. So we want that disease resistant community. So, so modern breeding, though, again, focuses on high productivity. We 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 start losing out on some of those species that we used to have. And we focus more on, you know, the typical ones that we see, like the Holstein one. So we've lost a lot of the genetic diversity in livestock over the years as well. So crops, livestock, big deal. Um, in terms of the global scene, I wanted to go and actually dig out some more data and kind of think. We've only focused on a few different species here. Um, but there's this, this website of the International Union for Conservation. Oh, what is it? Actually, let me jump ahead. International Union for Conservation of Nature. There it is. They have lots and lots of data. No, this did not turn out. I thought this was going to be a PDF, and it is blurry, but bear with me here on this photo. This is from there. They have the so-called red list of index of species, and this is their um, estimation of basically the extinction risk over time for these groups. So notice this is starts in the 1980s. 1980s. Mammals have declined a little bit, but we're doing pretty good in terms of their extinction risk. In general, I mean, this is really broad. Birds have stayed fairly flat, but we also st see a decrease. Um, amphibians have taken a big dive. We have we are really not doing a great job of keeping the survival risk of the group of amphibians. And look at corals. Corals have just taken a drastic drop in their this risk of extinction. A lot of this is due to these bleaching events where these corals die because of slight Differences in temperature or pH in their ecosystems. They're very sensitive, and we are seeing a really bad dive off of species survival. So we're losing biodiversity because of this extinction risk. Um, some of the other, some of the, some other data that I picked out from this website was on this PDF. Um, notice again, 41% of amphibians are the threatened variety. Um, notice birds down here, not so much. Mammals, 25%, but it's these big groups and also these uh, cycads. These are all water related. So clearly there's a lot going on in the water variety of species where we're seeing a lot of threatened. So what do we mean by threatened or endangered? So these are the categories that are generally used to determine the, the risk level of that species. Extinct being they're gone, so there's zero of them uh, anymore. Threatened is even worse, than, or worse than endangered. Threatened is there's a high risk of being extinct. So a threatened species versus near threatened, for example, and then least concern. These are only four categories. These are broken down into more granular categories as well. For example, I went to the Wikipedia page for the giant panda. If you ever go to Wikipedia and look up animals, on the right-hand side, right away you'll see their conservation status. So notice we've got the broad ESA or the IUCN. So that's that same, that same group, the International Union for Conservation of Nature. This is where these terms endangered and threatened and the granular ones come in. The ESA uses extinct, endangered, threatened, or delisted. They're not on there at all. So the IUCN, if you notice, extinct. Then EW, I don't actually remember what EW is, but we have um, endangered is right there in the middle, middle, vulnerable, not threatened over here, and then least concern. So for example, the giant panda, they would say this is the threatened group 
all these would be a threatened region to them. And vulnerable is on the far end towards almost almost towards not threatened. So they're not doing too bad, the giant panda. So the book lists some of these, but there are more. I just want to point that out. But there are a lot more of those. Um, and then the book shows this, and this is why I went to this website, because they showed some data from 2009 looking at birds, mammals, and amphibians. So if we look at birds, 79% of them are in the least concerned category. Mammals, 68%. But amphibians, only 51% are in the least concern, and 41% of them are, are threatened. So we're seeing a big issue with amphibians right now, and these are the ones that scientists are most concerned about at the moment. So we haven't talked a whole lot about uh, the causes of this declining biodiversity. So next lecture is when we're going to start digging into that. So this is looking ahead. This chapter really just introduced this idea of what is threatened? What is what is the idea of diversity and why do we care about it? So I hope you guys found that interesting. And I also included the review questions for this chapter. So here's some of these. And this is what is meant by we are in the midst of a sixth mass extinction. Well, if you read in your book, scientists believe that there were mass extinctions over history and that we're in the middle of another one. So I would say we're in the midst of a mass extinction. I don't know enough to really understand the idea of extinctions in the past. So, But right now we are in an extinction phase, according to the, the uh, scientists. Then we talked about why the genetic diversity is climbing. What is inbreeding depression? What is endangered species versus a threatened species? And then we talked about some of the, the amphibians, really the ones that are threatened the most right now. And some of this, these data points that we looked at, how many being lost per year? I think it was 50,000. So few review questions for you, and I will see you next time for key idea number two, identifying really the root causes of the declining biodiversity. I'll see you guys then.